Well, good evening again to those of you who have been here, and good evening to those who are just arriving. I'm Valerie Neal. I'm a curator here in the Air and Space Museum, and I'm the current chairman of our Space History Department. It's my pleasure on behalf of General Daly, our director, and indeed all the staff to welcome you here tonight to this lecture in our continuing series of Exploring Space Lectures. Uh, this is uh, the third of a series of four lectures this year that we have scheduled to celebrate the Hubble Space Telescope, its 25th anniversary since it was launched in 1990. And my colleague David Dvorkin, whom you've just met up here, has put together a stellar program of speakers. Uh, we've had two already who spoke about designing and servicing the Hubble Space Telescope, and tonight we are moving into a discussion of the scientific results of the telescope. Uh, we will have one more speaker at the end of June, June 30th, uh, Dr. Robert Smith, a historian, uh, who with David has done a good deal of work uh, documenting how the telescope came to be, surviving a number of crises, and ending up as the triumphant achievement that it is. So I would encourage you to put June 30th on your calendar as well. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to recognize our sponsors for this lecture series. Uh, we cannot do public programs like this without generous sponsorship. And our sponsors tonight are uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne Corporation, represented by Mr. Joe Cassidy, um, and also United Launch Alliance, represented by Mr. Les Kovacs. And I'd like to ask them to stand for a moment so we can all express appreciation to them. Thank you so much for your generous support of our programs here at the museum. And you are always welcome here. Uh, we have a bonus tonight. Uh, we have had uh, two individual speakers in the past, Frank, Frank Seppolina, who spoke about designing the telescope to be serviced, and Mike Massimino, one of the astronauts on servicing missions. So we have heard from the Italian contingent, and tonight we're going to hear from the Anglo-Saxons. And uh, you've already seen um, Bob Williams and Sandra Faber uh, in action, uh, but I'd like to tell you a little bit more about them than perhaps they told you. They're both modest beings. And trust me, uh, they have more awards, achievements, publications, trophies, uh, professorships than we could list in the time it would take to hold this whole lecture. So just trust me that they are that illustrious and you can find out more about them online if you wish. Uh, but I would like to highlight just a couple of aspects of uh, their achievements and their careers. Uh, Dr. Sandra Faber is a professor and a, a research astronomer at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and the Lick Observatory. And I believe you spent your entire career there? and which in itself is extraordinary. Uh, she came into the profession of astronomy uh, when it was still largely a male uh, profession and she and some others of her cohort have uh, proven that women can be extraordinary astronomers and scientists as well. Uh, I think she was fortunate to come of age when things were beginning to change and science was becoming more open to women and even even if it hadn't been becoming open, I think she would have pushed open that door herself. Uh, she is a recent recipient of the National Medal of Science, which was awarded to her just two years ago at the White House by the President. And as she mentioned a moment ago, she's been a member of the Hubble Wide Field Camera um, team for some number of years. Uh, she didn't mention that she is credited with solving the problem of what was wrong with the telescope right after it was launched. Uh, and she and her team figured out 
that it was spherical collaboration, and then that led to a solution that led to the first servicing mission, which led to the extraordinary discoveries uh, that we were able to see today so vividly. Uh, her main interests are in the formation and evolution of galaxies and in the structure of the universe and the changing structure. Uh, so I hope we hear about that tonight because I suspect most of us don't think of the universe as having structure other than those um, individual objects and clusters of objects that we see. And uh, she has led a deep field study using both the Hubble and the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. Uh, our topic tonight is the deep field uh, survey of the universe. Uh, Dr. Robert Williams has been with the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore in the 1990s. And as he mentioned, he has uh, been on faculty at the University of Arizona and also director of another observatory in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, he is a specialist in nebulae and nova, and he is the leader of the deep space, uh, I mean the Hubble Deep Field uh, project. Um, David tells me that um, Dr. Williams did an extraordinary thing when he was director of the Science Institute. One of the perks of that position is that he gets 10% of the observing time of the telescope to use at his discretion. And it's typical to dole that out to a variety of projects, uh, particularly those who uh, need to respond quickly to something that's just been discerned. But he had a different approach, and he decided to use that 10% to do a special project, a group project. And he invited astronomers from around the world to join him in a long long-term project using that discretionary time at his disposal. And that uh, approach resulted in the deep field survey that we will hear about tonight that led to the deepest penetration of the universe yet. You've had a sense of how these two colleagues interact. I think we're in for a lively discussion tonight. Uh, they will talk for a while and then we'll have questions and answers from the audience again. So, um, Sandy and uh, I'm sorry, Sandy and Bob, please join me here at the podium. And I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you so much. Uh, I'm informed that we're actually inaugurating something new here, Bob and I. This is the first time in this series that they've had two lectures at once. So, Bob, we better do a good job. <laughs> We're setting a new standard. <laughs> the goal here is, is to talk about uh, the observations that Hubble has made of distant galaxies. And, of course, in doing that, we've been taking advantage of the fact that a great telescope like Hubble not only looks out into space, but also looks back in time. So astronomers are the only scientists we know who actually can see th the past the way it actually was. So when we look back at the sun, it's a few minutes. When we look back at distant galaxies with the Hubble telescope, it's up to billions of years. So what we're going to do here is we're going to review some of the general achievements of Hubble, and then we're going to focus in on these deep field surveys, which Bob invented. And then at the end of our talk, we're going to end with some questions about the worth of projects like this. Was Hubble a good thing? Would we do it again? Have we learned any lessons? And that's going to be an opportunity in the Q&A for the audience to pitch in and say a few words, too. Now, we are talking about the formation of galaxies. That's what we mean by the structure in the universe today. And it's really helpful to get some impression of in your brain as to what we mean by that. And this picture, this video, I think, does a really good job. It's by Brent Tully from the University of Hawaii. We're starting out by flying through the Milky Way in the direction of Orion. And Orion falls apart because constellations are not really groups of stars in space. They're just lineups along the line of sight. 
We're passing the Orion Nebula, which is a shining cloud of gas. That is the birth cloud of a generation of stars. Here's another such cloud. When we see these shining regions, we call them H2 regions, we, um, it's usually true that they have been lit up by the light of very young, massive stars, which causes the birth clouds to glow. So um, the gas is normally invisible, but when it glows, it gives off these beautiful colors. And now the camera is panning around to another glowing cloud, but this one is quite different. This is a death cloud. This is ejecta that were sent out in the supernova explosion of the Crab Nebula about a thousand years ago. If you look really closely, you can see its pulsar pulsing in the middle. And uh, those very, are very important. They send heavy elements out into the interstellar medium, which are crucial in making dust grains and planets. And now the part of this video that I think is most remarkable, we're flying out of the Milky Way in a way that probably we will never be able to do. This galaxy looks rather like our, our galaxy. That's why it was chosen. Those are the Magellanic Clouds coming into view, the Fornax Galaxy. And now the camera is panning around to look at the rest of the local group. There are two bigger galaxies at the other end of the local group. group. One of them is this relatively small spiral called M33. We're going to fly through it, and we're going to fly through its big birth cloud, another area of star formation. There's our sister galaxy, Andromeda, in the corner before the camera pans away, and now we're looking at surrounding galaxies in the universe. And some very familiar pictures that are beloved by amateurs are coming through the field of view, including the large spiral M101, there it is, and the Whirlpool Nebula, where spiral structure, that there it is right there, was discovered by Lord Ross about 130 years ago. So you will be observing that galaxies are not uniformly distributed in space. They're kind of in filaments. And where the filaments intersect, that's where you get big clusters. And we're going to fly down a filament right now towards the Virgo cluster, which is our nearest big cluster in space, about a 1,000 galaxies. And right at the very center of this cluster is a huge elliptical galaxy, 10 times bigger than our Milky Way. Okay. Now, where did all of this stuff come from? What's the current picture? The current picture is really remarkable. If we go back to a time here, 10 to the minus 35 seconds, OK, there you see. That's just about the smallest number I know of. And a temperature that is enormously huge, 10 to the 27 degrees Kelvin. That was a moment just after the Big Bang. And the physics of matter was different then. If you want to ask me questions in the Q&A period, we can go into it further. But the net result is that there was something called a scalar field, which was extremely remarkable. As the universe expanded, its density did not go down, its energy density. And when you put that kind of thing into Einstein's equations, it drives the universe into exponential uncontrolled expansion. It actually expands faster than the speed of light, believe it or not. And the net result is that that huge expansion is what made space as we know it today. It continued to expand after that, but it, that was the genesis of space. And also, when you have a universe that expands faster than the speed of light, it, dev it develops fluctuations, density fluctuations. I've tried to show them here on this slide. Not large, just a part in 100,000. For a long time, they sat there and didn't do anything. But after about half a, a million years, gravity began to take over. And around a peak where there was high density, the universe expanded less fast. It was retarded. By the same token, in a valley, the universe expanded super fast because there was less gravity there to hold it back. And the net result is that matter moved from the valleys onto the peaks. The peaks ran away. We call it a gravitational instability. And we have an example in economics. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. This is the history of our galaxy. Fortunately, we were one of the peaks. OK, so um, galaxies are 
found it around these little peaks. And what's really amazing is that the size of our Milky Way when it was first born as a fluctuation was about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. And today it is about 100,000 light years across. And I think that's the most remarkable sentence that I could ever have said as a human being. That is truly, I have never gotten over being totally amazed by that. We could talk more, but let's continue moving through the story because we are trying to give you some background of why Hubble is important. And the point is that there was a theory, there was a picture before Hubble, and I'm explaining that picture. So now let's imagine that we've made some fluctuations and gravity has been doing its thing for a little while. The fluctuations have grown. In this movie, what is blue uh, and diffuse, that's hydrogen and helium gas coming out of the Big Bang. And gravity is condensing it into little globs, which then fall together to make bigger globs, and that's where stars are forming. So this is a, a rather nice visualization of how we think galaxies form coming out of the Big Bang. And look at those filaments, right? We saw the filaments on larger scale when we flew through our universe, but there have been filaments from the very beginning, even, if, even if, uh, at the outset. So you can see matter streaming down the filaments, and where the matter becomes dense, it's dense enough to make stars. And when it falls into those little pockets, it has some angular momentum, and it tends to spin like water going down the drain in your sink. And so what we get very early on is a bunch of spinning disks, and then the disks merge to make larger structures. And every time they merge, any stars that have been formed before that time, they get thrown into a halo. We call it a spheroid. And any remaining disk gets to fall in, sorry, any remaining gas gets to fall in and reform the disk. And that's what's going on here. So this is supposed to be a, a visualization of our own Milky Way. And you can see that the early formation of galaxies, according to this theory, is quite violent. There should be lots of mergers. The early galaxies should look disturbed. They should also look small because not much matter has fallen into them. And then gradually, as time goes on, they settle down. Galaxies move apart. The mergers are less frequent. And we get um, stable structures like this that consist of spheroids and disks. And that's, that's really what we see when we look at the universe today. Now, another part of this theory is that galaxies are the place where stars form. Galaxies are where the action is. You know, if we didn't have galaxies, then the universe would just become more diffuse with time. And it would be this really dull, boring, uniform density, very low density soup of hydrogen and helium coming out of the Big Bang. It wouldn't do anything that's interesting. So everything starts because of those fluctuations and the gravity attached to them. It's galaxies that make star and planets formation possible. They're what make intelligent life possible as we know it. Okay, so here is this region here, one of these regions that's intensely star forming, being lit up by new stars. This is the Hubble picture of that region um, in a nearby galaxy. It's the same place where we just flew through in our video. And the structure of these regions tends to be all the same. There are a bunch of hot stars that are very young. They put out a lot of ultraviolet light. The ultraviolet light goes out and lights up the birth clouds and causes them to shine. And that's what makes the beautiful colors. And some of the very most beautiful pictures taken by Hubble are of regions like this. And I thought I would show you this one. Hubble is now the Space Telescope Science Institute is getting to the point where we understand these structures well enough and we can even try to convert a two-dimensional image taken by Hubble into a three-dimensional map. So obviously there's a little bit of uh, guesswork in this picture, but this is a star-forming region. The young cluster is visible in the upper part of the picture. The cluster, with its young stars, sends out a rain of ultraviolet photons that impacts the birth clouds. And the result is something like the Bryce Canyon, in which rain beats down and forms pillars. 
And that's what we see over and over again in these areas. Okay, so I'm highlighting all the really high points of galaxy formation theory. Gravitational fluctuations coming out of the Big Bang. Star formation in dense areas making young stars. And the last big thing I want to mention is active galactic nuclei, the suspicion that active galactic nuclei are growing black holes. What are active galactic nuclei? Well, familiar word for them is quasars. So Hubble has uncovered a lot of evidence for the truth of this. It takes pictures of the centers of galaxies. Here's one. And we see a lot of weird stuff going on in the vicinity of these centers. And here's one of the most famous pictures, the jet in the galaxy M87. So the thought here in all of these examples is that there's a black hole at the center. Matter is falling onto it, creating a swirling disk. In the process of falling into the hole, the disk gets hot and shines. So it's a paradoxical thing. Some of the most luminous things in the universe are actually gas that's swirling around black holes. So here is a, here's a, an art, sort of an artist's conception of what one of those regions might look like. We're going to fly down into a galaxy. It has a black hole at the center. There's the swirling matter around it. Finally, some stuff manages to lose angular momentum and make a disk right near the black hole. And that disk is unbelievably hot and unbelievably bright. And that's what makes the light of the quasar that we see. So in the 70s and 80s, when we were developing this picture, these were just predictions. And the question was how to prove that. Could we actually look back in time and see this whole story unfolding? Enter Hubble. And so I'm going to turn it over to Bob now. And you're going to tell the next chapter. So. Um, in the 70s, as Sandy has just mentioned, um, there were a lot of interesting observations in theoretical models that were advanced because of uh, high-level uh, computing power that started to emerge in the 70s. So astronomers were itching to test these theories. They wanted to build facilities. It was at this time that NASA announced that it was interested in constructing a, a space station. And in order to shuttle uh, both uh, people and um, uh, facilities up to the station, they were going to develop um, a shuttle transportation system, STS. And astronomers immediately realized, ah, perfect. Put a telescope on the shuttle and get it into space. And so, in fact, uh, the idea emerged of a space telescope. It was not a new idea. Longtime Princeton professor Lyman Spitzer, who started his career at the RAND Corporation, a think tank that still exists, had uh, written part of a report that RAND did right after World War I, 1946, on the possible uses of activity, human activity in space. He wrote a five page uh, a part of the report that it would be really interesting to put a telescope in space. Now, uh, and he uh, mentioned some of the problems that could be solved if that were to be done. But of course, there was no, in 1946, this was an idea that was a uh, half century ahead of its time. So an interesting idea, but people forgot about it. It was resurrected in the 70s when the idea of the space shuttle came about. So the fact is, astronomers got together when, uh, with NASA, and with the National Academy of Sciences, came up with proposals to uh, uh, build a space telescope, work with Congress to get it funded, you know, great discovery tool, educational tool. And in fact, what emerged from all that activity that occurred over 15 years, so starting in the 70s and going up until uh, 1990, basically, was what initially was called the Large Space Telescope. Then astronomers changed it because we realized, oh, if it works out, and you have a large space telescope, and you ever want a, a future generation, uh, uh, politicals would say, hey, look, you already got the large telescope up there. So we dropped the large and just called it Space Telescope. And then when it was launched, uh, we named it after Edwin Hubble. So in fact, 
Hubble Space Telescope is the project that emerged from this, and it, it really had a 15 to 20 year development time. And in fact, really the initial idea came 1946 from Lyman Spitzer, really one of the, the, the father of Hubble Space Telescope. So telescope was uh, constructed uh, largely integrated by Lockheed Martin, uh, um, tremendous involvement of uh, the astronomical community in it, and it was launched in 1990. It was delayed because of the Challenger disaster, but it went up in April of 1990, almost exactly 25 years ago, just, uh, what is it, two months ago now, we've celebrated the 25th anniversary of successful operation of uh, what we call HST, Homo Space Telescope, and so it was sent up on uh, in a discovery. Um, the first two months of the telescope were set aside to do checkouts. Yeah, bring all the instruments up, uh, check the software. The telescope had to be outgassed because, um, you know, if you park your car in the sun with the windows up for a couple of days and you come back, you get this white film on the inside of the windshield. That is due to the fact that ultraviolet light from the sun uh, causes the release of gas from the plastics in your dashboard and complicated chains of molecules called polymers are released and they tend to be uh, very sticky on clean surfaces. And so the fact is uh, Hubble had to be outgassed for a couple of months uh, because uh, with the mirror protected because that outgassing would have coated the mirror and caused the throughput to go down. So in any event, there was this two month period with all the checkout of, of the various systems, the archiving, the computers and the like. The instrument teams, uh, one uh, important member of whom was Sandy, of course, were working on the initial images that would be to ta uh, taken to focus the telescope. Now, every astronomer goes through a focus test on a telescope every night that we observe, ground-based telescopes also. Usually they're simple systems Right, you got a concave mirror, most of them are large mirrors, you got a secondary mirror, and you have to change the position, relative uh, position of the two mirrors in order to achieve the proper focus. And so as part of the checkout, there were to be taken early focus images. So this happened, I'm not sure what, I would guess uh, maybe three weeks, a month uh, after the telescope was launched. And this is the first uh, image that was um, taken uh, of the focus of the telescope. And uh, I can tell you, as someone who has looked at a lot of focus images, this is not generally what you see for a telescope that's out of focus. Yes, you will get a fuzzy blob, but you do not see the structure that you see in these images here. And so that was a very concerning to astronomers. Now this was not good news because in fact NASA had gone through a series of, of foci and they didn't find a focus that was better than this. In other words, it did not appear that there really was a focus that was appropriate, that was uh, proper for this telescope. In addition to which, the astronomers looked at this and thought, you know, it's not just a focus problem. There is something fundamentally that may be wrong here. Not news, of course, that NASA wanted to hear because this was the most scientific, uh, most expensive scientific project in history at the time. And it was not uh, good news that uh, there may be serious problems with the telescope. So there was actually a bit of tension between the instrument teams and the uh, people in NASA. What uh, Sandy did with uh, her team, um, working with a colleague, Todd Lauer, that you see in this image here, John Holtzman, a colleague of mine, Chris Burroughs at Space Telescope, they considered that, in fact, it might not just be a focus problem, that there may be some fundamental problems with the mirror in the form of aberrations. Now, all of you that have taken pictures with a single lens reflex, you know, your Nikon camera, where you have your lens uh, there uh, sticking out from the camera, uh, know that there are about six or seven independent elements of of glass, individual lenses in that macro lens, each of which is put there to minimize aberrations in order to give you an optimal focus over a wide field of view. And those aberrations have names like coma, astigmatism, pincushion distortion, spherical aberration and the like, and they refer to fundamental uh, um, 
characteristics of the shape of the lens or the mirror. That is not something that a simple change in position can correct. And so what Sandy did in leading this team was to consider software where they represented, simulated these different uh, aberrations and predicted exactly what the images of the telescope would look like if it suffered from coma, astigmatism, spherical aberration, or the like. And fortunately or unfortunately, bingo, they showed that the code, let's see, which you see the actual focus run. So here's the data for um, image of a star for different uh, positions of the mirror, different uh, uh, foci, compared with what you expect from a model if there was a non-negligible amount of spherical aberration in the telescope. And you can see the match is really spot on. And so when they presented this to NASA, the conclusion was the telescope was not just out of focus, it suffered from a fundamental flaw in the shape of the mirror, spherical aberration with no easy fix. Bad news. Senator Mikulski, the patron saint of Hubble Space Telescope, called it a techno turkey. <laughs> Our son, uh, the engineer I referred to in the uh, warm up uh, session, uh, once phoned me and said, hey dad, how's Rubble Space Telescope? <laughs> <laughs> so astron it was a bad time for astronomy. Uh, two troubles? Hubble, yeah, that's right. One Hubble, of the Hubble sees double. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the okay. astronomers will tell you, never name a telescope uh, uh, with any a word that rhymes with trouble. <laughs> and, and Hubble was it. So we had spherical aberration, what to do? Now, the telescope still operated better than any ground telescope, but that's not why you spend $2 billion. So uh, committees were formed, ideas came in. Some of the ideas were, hey, we put the telescope up there, let's deorbit it, bring it back down, fix it, send it back up. That was a no-op. We knew that that telescope ever hit ground, it would never see the light of day. So in fact, one of the best ideas was to do what you do with your single lens reflex, right? You stick another corrective element in there that corrects the aberration. And so in fact, it was shown through optics or ray tracing that we could insert two little mirrors the size of a quarter in the optical path with the right shapes by taking out one of the five instruments and replacing it with a system that would correct a spherical aberration. And you could do it on orbit. And so in fact, that was done. So within a three year period, we diagnosed the problem, uh, developed the equipment, and got, uh, 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 trained the astronauts to go up there in this famous uh, first servicing mission that was one of NASA's great accomplishments, really. Uh, sort of, after landing on the moon, but um, demonstrating that humans really could work in space, and they uh, corrected the spherical aberration of the telescope. Corrected a number of other things. It turns out that the solar arrays were, uh, had uh, a stem that uh, consisted of two elements with different coefficients of expansion. And so every time the telescope, which has an, um, an orbit of uh, 96 minutes, so every 48 minutes it goes from sun to uh, where it's hot, to dark shade where it's cold. And so the change in the coefficient uh, in the expansion of the uh, stem would uh, cause the solar arrays to burp like a Tupperware and the telescope would ring for 30 seconds. And so it'd screw up the images. So they had to replace the solar arrays. So all sorts of interesting things were done. But the amazing thing was in five spacewalks, those guys nailed it, you know. And we got a working telescope where we gave up only 4% of the field of view and 4% in throughput. So had a fabulous telescope. So I'm gonna show you four images here, two of which are before after, and two of which are comparison of space and ground base. So here is a, a good ground-based image, right, with uh, 0.6 arc seconds resolution. Don't worry about that particular unit. But you can see, from the ground, as good as you can do of a star would look like this. Even with spherical aberration, you had a substantial amount of light in a, a very small uh, angular size. And so the telescope still did perform well. But uh, after the uh, fix, it uh, just worked like it was supposed to. 
so uh, sigh of relief, you know, uh, we did it right, and I have very good things to say about NASA. And by the way, I do want to say we, um, in our institute, we're in charge of the science operation of the telescope. We're on the Johns Hopkins campus up in Baltimore at Space Telescope. But we work very closely with the Hubble Space Telescope Project, which is at Goddard Space Flight Center. Great people, do such a competent job. And, and so really working with NASA headquarters here in, in Washington and with Goddard, uh, it is a great a team, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be a part of it. Uh, the next slide, again, just shows another before and after picture of one of the galaxies that Sandy was showing. Here's what things looked like with spherical aberration, and here's what they look like afterwards. And you can see that if you're trying to resolve individual objects, which are just fuzzed together here, poor resolution, it really did make a darker background so objects would stand out more clearly, and um, uh, you could resolve them better. Same thing if we uh, compare, and I can't read this. Uh, in fact, you probably can't either. It looks like it's off the top. But this is a ground-based uh, image of uh, a galaxy. And you can see what the best from a very large telescope, 8-meter telescope on the ground, does in comparison with Hubble now when it's operating well. And you see so much more. So it really did make study of distant faint objects possible. And here's a final picture. Again, you can see one of these gaseous nebular clouds where there's uh, thousands of stars that you can actually individually resolve here. Here, you don't see them. So space is a place to put your telescope. <laughs> Um, so let's uh, let me go on with the theme of the distant universe. But uh, uh, in honor of uh, Hubble's 25th anniversary, before I do that, let me just show you several slides that indicate some of the important discoveries that uh, Hubble's been involved with. One is the first detection in visible light of a planet around another star. That uh, nearby star, uh, 20 light years away, is a Fomalhaut, and um, it's a bright star. And of course, planets are very faint with respect to the much brighter star. And so if you're trying to detect them, you have to stick an occulting disk to block out the light of the star. So you can see that here, where there's an occulting disk that's been put in this instrument on Hubble. And what you see is this very faint ring of material here that is blown up here. And I'm not sure if you can make it out very well, but when you see the detail here, there are images here that have been taken over almost a decade in which there is a little dot there that indicates the travel of a planet about 10 times the size of Jupiter in orbit around this star. So we are now actually seeing, for the first time, planets around other stars. You know, they're just little dots right now, but still really interesting data. Star formation. We've always been fairly sure that stars formed in gas clouds, that they condensed out of them. And here are some images where you actually see this swirling gas that is starting to condense and form stars. And here's four examples of stars that are forming in a relatively nearby cloud in the constellation of Orion. And then we superpose some other uh, condensations that represent stars that actually are further along in their evolution. And you actually see um, uh, dust clouds around these stars. And you see them shining in the center. So you see the formation of the star and a ring of dust around them. And in some of these condensations, where we're actually looking along the plane of the object, Here's an object here where there's a star. Here's this dust cloud that you see in a disk where you're looking along the plane, quite large, 10 times the, uh, 17 times the uh, size of the orbit of the dwarf planet Pluto. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we actually have very nice data now um, that um, relates to the formation of stars. Black holes, again, Sandy said something about those. Uh, it turns out that if you take a telescope and uh, put the light uh, through a, a, a prism, break the light uh, um, into the colors of the spectrum, it turns out you can determine the velocity of the material, of the gas. And so this is the main reason for uh, 
demonstrating that there are very massive compact concentrations in the centers of galaxies because you see from the Doppler effect, and again, it's, I'm, we don't have time to explain this here, but here is a spectral feature at a particular wavelength that is subject to the Doppler effect, and you can see that as you look at the light, as you get close to the center of this galaxy, suddenly it, it turns blue because of a very high approaching velocity, and then you go to the other side of the galaxy, very short distance, and suddenly its velocity changes to one that is receding. And so we can determine from those velocities how much mass is required to produce that, and so we get an idea of the mass of the central object there. And we can determine what the size is here, and simply from this distance here. And it turns out that it has to be something that is very compact and having masses of tens of millions of suns. And so if you determine what the escape velocity is from such a configuration, it turns out to be comparable or even in excess of the speed of light. It means you've got a black hole. So it, most galaxies have this type of, of uh, uh, phenomenon in it. Um, we are running behind more than I would like to, and so let me uh, just show you a picture here. It's all right, it's right? It's all right, right. Yeah, 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 you can say that, but we've got uh, David Dvorkin here. He's, no, 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 that was David who said that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, David, take a walk. <laughs> Einstein's uh, theory of uh, general relativity, uh, basically, um, well, first a theory, then confirmed in a solar eclipse by Arthur Eddington in 1919, indicates that light is subject to warps in space-time. That is, that the uh, path of light is changed by a very strong gravitational field. And so if you have a concentration of galaxies, a lot of mass, here's our telescope, we're looking at this distant object, let's say it's a galaxy or a very bright supernova, and the light of that traverses near or through this dense concentration of material, it turns out that path will be distorted. And so instead of seeing this as just a point source, what you will see here are arcs. That is, it would uh, the gravitational mass would act just like a lens. And so it would make these arcs, and in fact, we observe the phenomena, really beautiful, uh, so-called Einstein arcs here. So what you have here is a galaxy. That's a concentration of mass. We're looking at a distant galaxy right in this direction, but what we are seeing instead is the light from that distant object beyond the galaxy, uh, change deviated such that you form this ring. It's called an Einstein ring. Same thing here where the lens is not just one galaxy, but a cluster of galaxies. So there's a distant object back here and you see this beautiful ring. So the interesting thing is that the light of the distant object is enhanced by this process, meaning that you can see more a distant objects than you would otherwise see because that lens acts to enhance the light. In addition to which, by determining the characteristics of this arc, you can determine how much mass is producing this curvature. And the really interesting result is that there is tremendous amount of matter there, more so than you actually see producing the light. And so we conclude that clusters of galaxies and even galaxies themselves consist of a tremendous amount of material that does not interact with light and therefore we call dark matter. We have no idea what it is, but this is one of the really interesting um, areas of uh, astrophysics right now, Believe, knowing that 80% of the matter in the universe is stuff that we have no idea what it is, it doesn't emit light, it doesn't scatter light, it doesn't absorb light, really bizarre stuff. So, back to the distant universe. Uh, so there were some of us, as soon as Hubble was fixed, that said, gotta look at the distant universe, gotta look back in time, try to piece together the evolution of the universe. One of the great figures of Hubble Space Telescope, together with Lyman Spitzer at Princeton, was John Bacall, also at Princeton. 
John, the very month that Hubble was launched, put out with some colleagues this paper predicting what Hubble should, uh, what advances that it should make <clears throat> in Science Magazine. And he actually was very cautious about using Hubble to study the distant universe because basically, based on credible models, he felt that distant galaxies would be too faint and too small for Hubble really to reveal exactly what was out there. And so he wrote this paper, we do not expect HST to reveal a new population of galaxies. In agreement with authors, previous authors, to suggest the major contribution will be revealing some of the characteristics of galaxies that we already know about. So there was some doubt of the wisdom of taking a large amount of time and putting it into a very risky project um, like the Hubble Deep Field. But there was a game changer. It turns out a young postdoc, Mark Dickinson at the Institute, had been awarded the largest program on Hubble at that time after the fix to take an image of a known galaxy because uh, of its uh, intense radio emission. So he uh, was awarded 32 orbits of the telescope, which at that time was a huge amount of time, to take this one image, 32 orbits, of this galaxy that uh, was a radio source. And it turns out from its velocity, we knew what its distance was, the expanding universe, and it, the look back time, that is its distance, was eight and a half billion light years. And realized from the expansion of the universe, we know that the time since the Big Bang is 13 and a half billion years. So we were looking back 60% in this image to the time of the Big Bang, which was, um, which was impressive at that time. And no one had come uh, close to uh, being able to image a galaxy that looked like this. And here you see the detail of these objects. And so at morning coffee, there were a group of us who got together and said, we've got to really uh, push Hubble telescope into the distant universe, knowing that there was a, a lot of people who wanted uh, their own programs on the telescope. And of course, they had John Bacall saying, eh, be cautious about this. You're not sure you're going to get anything. So, as either Dave, I think it was, uh, no, as, um, uh, yes, <laughs> uh, mentioned in her um, uh, introduction, the director of the institute has 10% of the telescope time at his or her disposal. And so I made the decision at that time that we should devote 10% of the telescope, a year's uh, worth of orbits, to studying the distant universe. Question was how best to do it. So I convened an advisory committee. One of the first people I contacted was Sandy Faber. We got about eight or nine others. We met for a day at the Institute debating exactly how were we going to do this. The most important question is, if we're trying to determine the characteristics of the universe, should we do what Mark Dickinson did is where he pointed the telescope at a known cluster of galaxies, which had been seen in the radio, or should we target some totally undistinguished area of the sky that, uh, that, uh, uh, that we could say was as typical as uh, possible and not target any known cluster of galaxies? And so this committee debated this question for a day and didn't come to a consensus. And there were other questions we had to solve. That is what filters to use, how much time, uh, what kinds of calibrations to take. In any event, so for a period of a couple months, uh, led by the three of us that you see in this image, we devised a program basically where we decided not to go for a targeted area. We were just going to find some sort of hole in the sky uh, that was truly indistinguished. Uh, take two weeks of the telescope time and take image after image in four different filters. We wanted color information because there is scientific information about the characteristics uh, that you get from that. And thus was born the idea of the Hubble Deep Field. So about nine months after all of this happened, this image 
the Hubble Deep Field emerged, which basically, this is a color picture that is reconstructed from the four filters that we use of 345 separate images, roughly 45 minutes each that we electronically added up. So not knowing what we were going to get, again, this was very risky, Hubble Deep Field came out of this. And so the good news was, there was a lot of stuff out there. It wasn't just a blank field. And you could see that there were some brighter galaxies that had form like the um, galaxies that are in our local neighborhood. And then there were lots of little dots out there. Now it was a pretty picture, but the fact is we didn't really know enough to analyze it because we didn't have the distances of these things. And so if you look at a portion of the deep field, like right here and blow it up, what you can see is there were some what we call grand design spirals, but there were also a number of very faint objects which could be very small and nearby, or they could be very distant and therefore uh, very early uh, uh, proto-galaxies. And so we needed to know the distances of these objects in order to interpret this very nice photo. We had anticipated this, and so we told the people at uh, Keck Observatories that they should take spectra, basically, of all of these objects, because we know that the universe is expanding, and from the spectra with a Doppler shift, you know, the I'm trying to show you the expanding universe. I've got it. Do I have the cursor? I need my reading glasses. Cursor on the There? Over there? Okay. No. Go for it, Sandy. No, wait. No, this. It's wrong slide. We need to advance the slide, right? Ah, there you go. Okay. We can put a man on the moon. <laughs> no comments. Thank you. <laughs> so in any event, in an expanding universe, the fact is, I'm going to go on with this quickly. In an expanding universe, the fact is all galaxies, and it is only space that is expanding, not the individual galaxies. They're gravitationally bound. Now you can barely see a grid here, but the fact is it is space that is expanding. So the fact is whatever galaxy you're on, all the other galaxies appear to be moving apart from you. And the further apart they are, the faster they're going. So if you can use the Doppler effect to get the velocity, which is very easy, you simply take a spectrum, you can determine the distances of these objects. And so here's a sort of a graphic that shows you if we're here in the Milky Way and we take spectra of all of these things to determine their distance, uh, their velocity, excuse me, we can get the distance. And so here's uh, an example of exactly how you do that. There's uh, two spectra here, and just from the shift in wavelength, you can determine the velocity, so you can determine the distances. And from that, we built up this graphic of the brightest galaxies in the Hubble Deep Field, where you see here the time since the Big Bang. That is, we're looking back in time. So the most distant objects are down here. That is, we're seeing them as they were eight, nine, 10 billion years ago. And then up here in this uh, abscissa here, the x-axis, what you're seeing is the intrinsic brightness of these objects, where the most luminous energetic are in this part of the diagram, and the less luminous, less bright, are in this part of the diagram. So what you see basically is a buildup where the distant galaxies, they, and you notice a color difference, that these tend to be reddish, older stars, dead stars. These are bluer, hotter, more massive young stars. And small dysmorphic shapes here that in time, because time is moving up, what you see is you start getting from these small asymmetric objects a more grand design, more symmetric. And so this picture indicates that in fact you could, through a deep image, determine the evolution of galaxies and it was clear that the earlier galaxies were different, they were smaller, they were more energetic than galaxies of the modern 
time. So this really was the result of the Hubble Deep Field that indicated that evolution was something that was very important and that Hubble was a tool that could be used to determine exactly what that galactic evolution was. And so it caused a host of subsequent deep fields to be taken, different areas of the sky, different wavelengths, you know, different attributes, and really the authority on these fields, subsequent fields, because she has been involved in them, is Sandy Faber, and so she's going to finish up by commenting on these. Thanks, Bob. Great. Okay. Yeah. So this this here summarizes the Candles project, which is uh, the largest t uh, project yet to be done on the Hubble Space Telescope. Nine hundred orbits altogether, and Candles uh, took um, a to uh, lots of exposures in these five different areas in different regions of the sky. You see them all to scale there with the moon, and in one of these regions, this one here. Candles astronomers and others as well have really drilled down to create what is called the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. And using a rather clever technique of looking just at the colors, we've now figured out roughly how far away these galaxies are. And so it's possible to take that extreme deep field image and arrange all the objects in space away from us at their correct distance. And so now we're flying down the Hubble extreme deep field, but we're also flying back in time. And the moral of this beautiful little video is to show, in fact, that the galaxies are changing as a function of time. They are truly evolving. And we have to put ourselves back to the situation the way it was 30 years ago. People then were still talking about the steady state universe. There were astronomers who thought that the universe was not evolving, and if we looked at the distant universe, it would look the same as the universe today. These pictures by Hubble have really put an end to such speculations. And with really deep images like the extreme deep field, we're now following the birth of galaxies to within just a few hundred million years of the Big Bang. Here's a, a set of sample images going from rather nearby and recent back to within, uh, you can't even see it, I can't see it, but maybe those of you up in the audience, there's a little red dot there. And that dot is 800 million years after the beginning of the universe, where the universe itself is, is some 13.7 billion years old. So this is a very active field of study. And I'll just give you a little taste of the kind of data that people measure. Th these are candles data. I, I know that this slide is unbelievably complicated. I'm not, I'm not going to explain it. Um, but what I want you to see is I want you to get some feeling for the richness of the data, the number of objects in our samples, which is getting up to thousands, if not tens of thousands. And I, I want you to look at this montage of plots because it's been put together in a sort of clever way here. Back in time goes down and massive galaxy goes off to the right. And so the point by looking at a picture like this is to see patterns. You can see that the squares are changing as a function of time and at a given time in a horizontal row, the pattern is different and depends on mass. So that's been one of the greatest contributions of Hubble, the so-called galaxy life cycle. The fact you alluded to this um, a minute ago, Bob, Galaxies form stars really rapidly in their infancy, and then they die down. They're sort of like fires that run out of fuel. And the bigger ones do this before the little ones. And so we, we now are putting together a history of all galaxies in the universe, including our own Milky Way. This has um, really been led by Hubble with support from ground-based telescopes getting spectra and redshifts. Okay, so now let's transition to our last topic, the last discovery of, of uh, Hubble, which is arguably the most unexpected of all and the most important for fundamental physics. And this is the discovery of dark energy or the accelerating universe.
it sort of fell out of nowhere <laughs> like that. And um, here, as, as this co cover of science says, it was a breakthrough of the year a couple of years ago. Very, very important. What does it mean? Is it a new kind of energy density? Something like the scalar field of inflation that I mentioned before? Do we have a new scalar field at this era of the universe? Is it a correction, a fundamental correction, to the sacred theory, general relativity, which is our theory of gravity from Einstein? Or is it something that Einstein himself thought of and put into the equations of general relativity, something called the cosmological constant? I, I just want to stress how fundamental this is. This is like discovering a new force. So take yourself back to the days of Newton, when Newton um, identified gravity as a universal force, or Faraday when he was discovering electromagnetism, or the nuclear force or the weak force that came to our attention in the 20s and 30s of the last century. This is, this is really very, very important for our understanding of fundamental physics. So important <clears throat> that it's been recognized by the award of a Nobel Prize in 2011. And the three people inside the little square there are astronomers who were using telescopes in order to figure out the existence of dark energy. So let me first of all say what it is. For years, we were trying to figure out the history of the expansion of the universe. Each one of these graphics shows time uh, moving forward from bottom to top. And there's a little graphic there that sort of shows you schematically the scale factor of the universe. So this one here is a universe that expands out of a big bang, but there's so much matter in it that it doesn't get very far. It falls back together again. It's like um, a, uh, a rocket going up from Earth and then falling back. Lots of gravity and a fallback. Here's another universe that expands for a while and then coasts. And finally, here's yet another, sorry, uh, it goes at a sort of critical density. That's a universe that just manages to expand to infinite size, like a, a rocket going out of the Earth with what's called escape velocity. This universe has more than escape velocity, and so it actually manages to arrive at infinity, infinitely large, with some leftover velocity. That's what we were trying to think about. Now, all three of these possibilities have only matter in them of the ordinary sort. And that matter is creating ordinary gravity, which is attractive. So all of these universes, these three possibilities, were getting slowed down. And the question was only, well, how much do they get slowed down? Do they fall back? Do they just make it to infinity? Or do they make it to infinity with energy to spare? Well, thanks to observations by astronomers, including Hubble, the reality turned out to be an accelerating universe. An accelerating universe starts out like a matter-dominated universe, but then something takes over, something that is effectively repulsive gravity that actually drives the expansion and causes it to go faster. So it's a, it's a cosmic tug of war. The force of dark energy surpasses that of dark matter as time progresses. So the early part of our universe was normal, and this dark energy seems to be coming to the fore only now. Now, how do we measure this? The answer is, on paper, it's, it's very simple. What you have to do is measure how fast the universe is expanding as a function of time. So you measure the local expansion velocity at a given moment at each time. And in order to do that, you have to measure a combination of how far away something is and how fast it's moving. If you can do that, you can make a map of this expansion history. So the favorite object that astronomers have been using to do this are something called a particular kind of supernovae. And they, here's an example of these taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. They're a different distance from us. And a few examples I've marked here with, with little arrows. These supernovae are not exactly all the same brightness. But to make a long story short, we can measure something about them that allows us to calibrate them and sort of fix things up as though they were all of the same brightness. And once we know that, 
from the brightness, we know how far away they are, and we measure their redshift, and we get the expansion velocity. You put all of that together, and you can figure out what the history of the expansion is. So here, is, here are the data as they existed when uh, the two papers were written in 1998 that caused the award of the Nobel Prize. And I, I show this here. Well, first of all, let me tell you what's plotted. This axis here has to do with the brightness of the supernova. And this is fainter here and brighter at the bottom. And this is velocity away from us that we get from the redshift from the spectra. So these are nearby supernovae, and these are successively farther away. The point of the slide is to show how ephemeral the claimed effect was back in 1998. Here is a, a sort of a neutral line in the middle. And the accelerating universe, as measured, is here. And the decelerating universes that people thought that they already understood are this dashed line here. And there's not a very big difference between the accelerating universe and the decelerating universe. And in fact, in order to really understand this phenomenon, you have to measure the brightnesses of these supernovae individually to about 10%. And as you saw in the picture, they're mixed up with galaxies. They're very faint, some of them. So this is an incredibly difficult challenge of measurement. Now, as it happens, in 1998, Hubble had not really contributed much to this subject yet. But that was about to change. And here are the latest data showing you what Hubble is contributing. These are data from ground-based telescopes. These are the latest data from Hubble out here. And basically, the picture I just showed you extended this far and no farther. And you can see the incredible weight of the Hubble data. Look at all of these galaxies here. And they are at least on or above the line, which is supporting the accelerating universe. So I will express my own personal opinion. My opinion is that I, I wonder whether or not they would have awarded a Nobel Prize in 2011 if Hubble hadn't come along in the meantime and really driven home the point from those original 1998 papers. I think Hubble has been absolutely key in establishing the reality of the accelerating universe. So that ends what we wanted to tell you tonight about the contributions of Hubble to galaxy evolution and cosmology. And we're moving now into a little bit of an epilogue. So maybe you would join me here, uh, Bob, at the, at the podium here. Um, this is the way we thought we would structure this. There are some topics that we're going to talk about for a few minutes. And then there are some audience topics that are more philo philosophical. And maybe we'll turn the lights on and use them to introduce the beginning of the Q&A. So let's start to talk about Hubble as a landmark science project, starting with its total cost. You provided me with that number, $8 billion to date. $8 billion, 20 years of uh, development, uh, construction, 25 years of operation, and five servicing missions, each of which is of the order of a billion dollars. OK. So that sounds like a lot of money. We've done a little bit of homework, and we've tried to find out what the cost is of ground-based telescopes. And Hubble is more expensive than ground-based telescopes at the level of, say, um, uh, a factor of 10 or so. Um, but ground-based telescopes are getting to be a lot more expensive. So there's a generation of extremely large telescopes being planned now. And they are, their costs are in the neighborhood of $1 to $2 billion. And the construction cost, as opposed to operations cost of Hubble, would be a few billion, right? Correct. Right. So the ground is, is catching up in terms of, of the cost of Hubble. Um, but also in terms of its capabilities. Yes, this is true. These telescopes, uh, these very extremely large telescopes, are being outfitted with something called adaptive optics. And on the ground, you can build things to larger diameters. So on paper, these telescopes should get a resolving power of a factor of 10 bigger than what Hubble has done. And that will allow them to see stars that are 100 times fainter than Hubble, which really is remarkable. In other words, if these telescopes work, 
the advance of these telescopes over Hubble will look like the advance of Hubble over the ground, just about the same factors. On the other hand, it's very ambitious, and those telescopes aren't built and working yet. Mm -hmm. um, so then we talked a little bit. Um, so we, we agree that Hubble is expensive. On the other hand, um, uh, it, 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 it's, it's the data that it has returned is, has been exceptional. We'll come back to that in a minute. Let's go to the next topic. Was the risk reasonable or was it overreach? And this is interesting because, of course, it failed and had to be fixed. So you had an opinion on that. Yeah, I thought it was a stretch originally. Um, um, obviously, what saved it was the fact that it was serviceable. And this was meant to be an important part of it. And, and but the question was, was it an overreach, uh, it, independent of the fact that things did turn out okay? Um, I would say it, w it, was, uh, it was close. And how would you have uh, reshaped the project back in those days in order to minimize the risk? I would have simplified the concept and uh, made it less uh, risky and also consider the possibility of building two of them. Absolutely. That's my solution. Smaller, simpler, and duplicates. Send up one, see how it does, and then see how the next one does. That was what I was thinking of at the but time. But we were fortunate. We were fortunate, right. Um, was it scientifically worth it? Uh, I think it was. It, um, definitely worth it. The thing, the premium of Hubble data is that the ground is now just getting to that point. And so Hubble's been working now, well, those ground telescopes won't be built for another 10 years. So Hubble had the, the ability to give us fantastic data 20 or 30 years earlier. It really accelerated the whole field. It broke open the history, the study of galaxy evolution, and uh, gave the whole question of cosmology a lot of momentum. And I think you, you, you deserve a lot of perks for being first. Yeah. And, and, and Hubble was definitely first. Now we can turn towards the direction of uh, other reasons why the government is interested in spending money in this, and that is to demonstrate our national technical prowess. And I particularly feel very strongly about this. I think astronomy is a great arena for doing that. It's a subject that's beloved by the public around the world. People pay attention to astronomical discoveries in a way that they don't to, say, chemistry. I hope I haven't offended chemists. <laughs> I probably have. <laughs> so I, I think as far as a PR for American technical effort, astronomy was very much well worth it. Comments? I agree. Okay. <laughs> no, and then this is her idea. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, okay, lessons learned from Hubble. It did have its troubles. Uh, I think you had some lessons that you wanted to mention. Well, I think it would have been a success in any event. You know, we all like the, the, the failure that, that turns out because of ingenuity to be a success. But I, I do believe that the discovery and the way in which we presented, you know, uh, the, the results of Hubble to the public was a key part of its success. And establishing a standard for other observatory projects. And also, in fact, the way we, we actually changed the culture and the way astronomy was done. Tell us about that. And, you know, Hubble Deep Field, basically, we had the right to keep the data proprietary for one year. And so the decision I made was that this was sufficiently important to the science that that would not be a good thing to do in spite of the fact that I had a team of 20, almost every one of them was young. There was one, Mark Postman, I believe. In fact, he didn't even have tenure at that time. So I had all of these postdocs whose career depended upon this. And I told them, if you're going to work on this, um, you do not have exclusive right to the data. We're going to make it public and, and uh, uh, you can work on it as soon as the public can get to it. And astronomy, of course, was famous uh, at that time for being dominated by a, a relatively small number of large telescopes you know, in California, where if you walked into an office of a well-known astronomer, you know, they open a drawer and they show you, here's my data, and then they uh, put it back in their drawer. We really changed the culture uh, such that in getting uh, cooperation, collaboration with Keck observatories to get the spectra, even before we took the deep field images because we knew we needed the spectra, we 
created this collaboration where everyone agreed if you were going to be a part of this, you had to make the data uh, public instantly. And that really has caused a sea change in the way large projects are done in astronomy. Yeah, I, I, I would say that we've gone a long way in that direction, but there are still quite a few California astronomers who, um, <laughs> who, who don't fully embrace that new concept, but they will. <laughs> I'll say a word or two about my lesson learned. My lesson learned from Hubble is why it failed. And it, in my opinion, it failed because the people who were polishing the mirror actually knew that the mirror was no good. In that team of, of people who were polishing the mirror, there were five men and uh, three or four of them were totally convinced that they were polishing the wrong curve. And this, this is a long, detailed story, which we don't have time to tell you everything, little bit of it. But the point was that there were two ways of measuring the, the shape of the mirror. Way one, which was used at the outset, and way two, which was used later. And when they traded off from way one to way two, suddenly the mirror looked as though it was terrible. And rather than getting to the bottom of that, rather than running right off to NASA and saying, we, we have a her horrible problem, help us get to the bottom of this, they covered it up. And they never, they never told people outside of their small enclave about their problem. So quite ironic, it was said, you know, when the spherical aberration was discovered, there were some people who already knew it was there because of this reason. So what is the lesson learned? The lesson learned is that when you're doing uh, complicated projects, you must have a climate of truth, and you cannot punish people for coming and telling you bad news. NASA was over budget with Hubble, Congress was beating them over the head, and that was the lack of trust, that kind of atmosphere that caused important information not to be passed on. And by the way, we saw that again later with the, the fact that Challenge, Challenger blew up when the O-rings didn't seal. There were engineers from the company who knew that that was going to happen and tried to warn the launch team, and that news was, uh, was suppressed. So NASA's done it at least twice. I think they've learned that lesson. I, think, I really do think they have. So th those are our comments. Why don't we turn the light on, and we'll have a Q&A, and we encourage you to speak a little bit about the audience topics here, and we'll hear your opinions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you too very much. And what a mind stretching. You can use this. Sorry. I said thank you too uh, very much. This makes a huge difference. What a mind stretching and mind bending uh, experience you've given us tonight. And uh, we would like to engage in some questions and, and responses with our speakers tonight. And I'll give you a hint. Uh, they would very much like for some of you to ask these questions. <laughs> so I know you have your own questions in mind, but some of you in the audience be brave and tackle one of these. Actually, I'll start. We, we want you to answer those questions. Yeah. <laughs> ah, okay. I'll start with the gentleman up here in stripes. Well, I have a question that I think has been very interesting. It's a philosophical one, but kind of on the answer. We're often talking about the visibility of the Okay, the question is about the term, the visible universe, and what does that really mean? And why, did the, why is part of the universe not visible? It, the universe is a lot bigger than we can see because it, a light hasn't had a chance to travel to us from those regions yet. So our visible part has a radius of 13.7 light years worth of travel time. And something that's just a little bit farther away will be seen, you know, in 100 million years from now or thereabouts. We're gradually uncovering bigger and bigger bits of it. So it's not invisible. It's just that there's not enough time to see that far out. All right, this gentleman. What are your hopes for the James Webb? What are their hopes for the James Webb Space Telescope? Interesting question. The successor. 
Oh yeah, no, uh, um, it, it should make really important uh, discoveries. Um, uh, planetary formation, again, the distant universe because of the red shift, so it's sensitive to the red. Um, my hopes are that it will do exactly what Hubble has done, and that is make discoveries that we did not anticipate. But I can't be more general than that. I think there are some things that we can point out that we're pretty sure it will really uh, elucidate some uh, problems that, uh, uh, or so solutions to problems that, that we now wonder about. Uh, the young woman at about the middle of the theater. Yes, you. Let me summarize very quickly then. Uh, uh, the audience member made a comment that, yes, indeed, the Hubble has touched people's lives. And evidence of that was the uh, public response when the last servicing mission was canceled and then revived. Uh, so the public has taken a great interest in it. And then the question is, what is the status of ground-based observatories, particularly the news that various ones are closing? So as it happens, I'm from the University of California and Lick Observatory, which just celebrated its 125th anniversary, is one of those places that's been spoken of as a place that might close. So Lick is unusual in the sense that it has an incredibly historic and beautiful refractor, which is a great attraction for the public. But it also has three working, uh, pretty capable, 2.5 meter and 3 meter telescopes, and it's developing new technologies like adaptive optics. That's actually where adaptive optics was first used on telescopes at Lick Observatory. So um, uh, the net result is the University of California has re reversed its decision to end funding, and we're actively looking for donors and other ways of keeping it open. I think it will stay open. About the radio observatories, I don't have any detailed knowledge. Uh, it costs the National Science Foundation $43 million a year to operate its share of the ALMA radio telescope, which is a large thing. And I, I really don't know what the outcome of that is going to be. In general, as telescopes move forward, and we're trying to build these behemoths now, uh, it is reasonable, I think, to think about closing smaller telescopes or to find new sources of funding for them. And people are trying to do that. So it's more a matter of funding than that their capabilities are no longer useful. It, I think it depends on what you mean by useful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I think they'll be providing supportive data mm. uh, and survey data. That is still worth money, but it probably doesn't capture the headlines. Let me just say that as far as Lick Observatory is concerned, first of all, that's where all of our graduate students and postdocs get hands-on training. So there's a training value of these things. And furthermore, the University of California spends over $20 million a year on its telescopes, including Keck and soon to be the 30-meter telescope. And the budget to keep Lick open was only 7% of that. So it, it really doesn't in that sense make very much sense to save 7% out of a budget and get rid of all the hands-on training aspect of your whole program. Did you care to add to that? 
I always put myself in the position of uh, someone in the military who wants to build an aircraft carrier or the like, and I, it, I, I always find it, uh, I've not been a part of the military, but I find it hard to believe that they think, well, we should give up this program in order to get this. And so I tend to uh, have an aggressive posture uh, to uh, this problem that you raise, and that is, although I agree it is reasonable to think of closing down older, smaller facilities, my feeling is go for it. And particularly if you use these things as educational tools, then let the political process play itself out, but don't offer it up. <laughs> Very good. Did you have a question, David? I simply wanted to... Uh... Uh, link the Hubble to the web uh, with your question, how does Hubble help us go on from here? I would like to know, what have we learned about the universe that went into the design of the web? And how is the web going to answer the questions that the Hubble has uh, helped us ask? Some of that can be predicted, some can't. But what I would say is that Hubble demonstrated that one can take a risk and get really va uh, real value out of it. Uh, the real problem, of course, with web is that it's not serviceable, and if there's any kind of failure, particularly because it's very expensive, I think right now it's around $6 billion, not quite at Hubble's level, but you can imagine, you know, depending upon what failure may happen, what are the consequences of that? And I think that is something that we have to uh, realistically at least anticipate uh, uh, dealing with. And, and so my answer is, uh, obviously, there would uh, be a, a natural sort of reaction. But I believe that if we do what we did with Hubble, we would recover from that. I can't tell you what the time scale would be. I do believe that society is coming to appreciate the value of risk and, um, and, and therefore, I think that uh, it is worth taking risk, even though you may pay a short-term price if things don't go well. And Sandy, would you care to comment also? I, I'll be frank. I'm, I'm worried because um, it's not fixable. So I, th I think there's a lot riding this. I think astronomers have sort of risked their future in NASA on a single throw of the dice. I hope things go well. Uh, I think we have time for one more question, and then there'll be an opportunity to um, meet and greet with the speakers as we leave the theater. Um, I indicated this gentleman would have a chance. In the area of being entertained by bubbles, I have two thoughts that I'd ask you to comment on. One is that the filament structure of the universe, as I've seen it represented, looks remarkably like the structure of the human brain. Yeah. And second, I'm thinking that maybe dark energy and or dark matter could be discovered as a roadmap to get us to faster than light travel. So I wondered if either one of you could comment on these two thoughts of entertainment. Uh, so this member of the mm -hmm. audience commented on a striking visual similarity between the filaments in the universe and the structure of the human brain, and also wondered whether dark matter, dark energy might somehow be linked to exceeding the speed of light. Do you want to talk about the brain? Um, not so much as the way of thinking. So as, um, my response is I tend not to think that way. <laughs> and the reason is uh, I'm influenced by the scientific process and Occam's razor, which says that in trying to understand an unknown phenomenon, try to understand it by minimizing the number of ad hoc hypotheses you make. In other words, try first to understand it in terms of things that you understand. And so for that reason, what you're doing is advocating something else, which may have validity. 
You know, I'm not doubting that. I'm just saying that the way I think is not that way. The path that I tend to follow is try to understand these things in terms of uh, things that I do understand. And then when they fail, then go ahead and try to make up an ad hoc hypothesis, but keep it to a minimum. So regarding the brain and the filaments, that is a prediction of uh, inflation plus the dark matter hypothesis. So actually, that's not surprising. The fact that you see a relationship there between the filament, the cosmic web it's called, and the brain, that, that surprises me, but <laughs> that's, that's your insight. Fractals. <laughs> see, uh, I will say something, though, about the faster than the speed of light. So I mentioned that when universes have this kind of uh, energy density that doesn't decline as a function of uh, size of the universe, doesn't become more diffuse, it drives the universe into a faster than light expansion. So in fact, the presence of the dark energy is creating a faster than light expansion. We're sort of just moved into that transition. We haven't seen its effect yet, but if you were to live for billions of years and target some distant galaxy, as thanks to dark energy, you would see it accelerating. And it would accelerate faster and faster and faster, and when things get to the speed of light, they disappear. It actually would go faster than the speed of light, but you would never see it do that. You would see it redshift out of sight. And so, in fact, in something like about 100 billion years, the whole universe is going to be invisible now. It will have redshifted out of sight, and the only thing that will be left within view is what's gravitationally bound to our local group of galaxies, which of course by that time will be highly faded, you know, remnants of their of their past selves. And we won't be here. We will, well, I wouldn't say that. No, 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 no. Our, our descendants could very well be here if, if, we, if we are determined oh, that I we mean, should. Oh, I meant we solve. personally. We personally. <laughs> this is true. Right. Uh, but, I but I'd just like to say this is truly the golden age of cosmology because we can still see the whole universe. Mm -hmm. the, the universe is going out of sight and then it will be extremely hard if we haven't made durable archives for anybody to figure out where it came from because nothing will be visible except a few galaxies. Very intriguing. I think in the company of people who are this brilliant and this committed to understanding the universe, we could stay here all night and probably all day tomorrow and even beyond that, uh, talking with them and, and uh, picking their brains for interesting ideas. But all good things must come to an end, at least in this theater. And uh, I would like again to uh, thank our speaker, certainly, uh, for joining I would also like to thank our sponsors from Aerojet Rocketdyne and United Launch Alliance as well. Uh, I'd like to thank David Devorkin for organizing this lecture series. And last, I'd like to invite you all to leave the auditorium through the uh, doors at the upper level. And we are going to escort our speakers to the Welcome Center desk in Milestones of Flight. Uh, they will be available, um, I guess, uh, at least for maybe a half hour um, to talk with you. And I think they have brought some giveaways that uh, you might want to take home with you as well. I'm sorry we could not get to everyone's questions but maybe you'll have a chance to ask it directly. Thank you and good night.